So think about this interview question. What motivates you more? Uh, the joy of winning or the sorrow and the hatred of losing? Now, we all like to win, and most of us uh, hate to lose. But how do you view losing? Does it motivate you or does it depress you? Does it excite you or do you just learn from it? Now, this interview question we're going to be talking about quite a bit in this interview, <laughs> my interview with the guest, and his view on sales. I think you're going to like this episode, especially if you feel like you're selling a commodity, because what this guy is selling is basically uh, countertops and uh, build-outs for kitchens and to large industrial uh, buildings, hotels, um, apartment buildings, things like that. Now, you've got to imagine that people are going to try and commoditize that because uh, is there magic to it? Well, we don't think there is, but there can be because we've got to focus on what our client wants to accomplish, talking to the right people, all of them, not just one of them. Most of us get stuck talking to a single individual within an account, and we don't really cover it all and are unable to control the decision, guide the decision, differentiate ourselves, and stay out of the price-only trap. This price-only trap really catches us because we fall into the paradigm of our client versus guiding our clients into the paradigm of what we do. How are we different? Think about the last thing you bought. When you go on to Amazon or you go into the store, you're thinking, I want a certain amount of functionality, a certain price range, and a certain level of quality. Now, all of a sudden, you f when somebody guides you through the differentiators there and shows you the differences in quality, then you kind of open your mind up that, hey, that's worth additional money because you want that quality. We've all made the mistake of buying something, thinking that we're getting the right amount of quality for the price. And it turns out, ah, uh, we were optimistic. Our clients are that way. That's why we have to learn how to connect with them, have conversations with them about what they care about that turn into things that they need to care about. So that's what we're going to talk about today. I think you're really going to enjoy this interview. Before I get into it, make sure you're checking out covideo.com. Video email is a game changer this year. Video is changing the way people are connecting with each other. It's highly personalized, relevant, valuable. Check it out. Give it a shot, covideo.com. And also my favorite CRM, pipedrive.com. Get a 60-day eval with the Brutal Truth coupon code. Check it out. It's the one I use. It's highly powerful. We all need a personal CRM, even if the company has one. we got to keep track of all our contacts and context. And also, they got a great blog at pipedrive.com, coupon code Brutal Truth. Let's get into the interview. And for those of you interested in the courses or already in it, uh, make sure you're checking out the one-on-ones that I'm putting into the course a 30-minute one-on-one with each individual, as well as the office hours. I'll give everybody an update on the course at the very end. I'll also give you my take on the question. Are you more motivated by winning or avoiding lose? Here we go. Hey, Kyle, thanks for joining us today. As a way of getting started, tell us about yourself. Uh, well, um, you want the whole story from the beginning or nope. <laughs> yes. no, okay, cool. Just, just the uh, highlights. Cool. Uh, born and raised Grand Rapids, Michigan. Um, uh, live in Indianapolis, Indiana now for probably the last like decade came down here for an opportunity to be in frontline sales at Angie's list, uh, back when they were the biggest brand in the home improvement industry, uh, parlayed that into a really, really successful, uh, management career. Uh, when Home Advisor came to Indianapolis, for lack of a better term, a bit of a hostile takeover, or to put them out of business, um, they kind of attracted the top 10% away from Angie's List at the time to come work for them. Uh, I had to go back to the sales uh, floor and prove that I could do, I prove I could really walk the walk and not just talk the talk. Uh, I was the first one promoted in the Indianapolis office, then had a really, really nice career at Home Advisor. Yeah. until it was just time for a change. Uh, one of my old employees gave me a call. He's the vice president of a local roofing company called Stay Dry Roofing. 
Um, needed some help growing there, you know, just growing, expanding sales training, all the things that we've all done together. And then in a very short period of time, we had a lot of success. And then the same owners of Stay Dry uh, owned the company that I work for now, which is called Vanities International. And it was kind of a small business promotion. So I went from the regional, I went from running sales from Stay Dry as a regional, regional director, manager of sales to the VP of sales for Vanities International. So, cool. And it's pretty how cool. many reps do you have? Right now I have five. Wow. I need to have... I need to have double that in hopefully by the end of the year, but if not uh, within the year, for sure. And, and who do the reps sell to? They sell direct primarily uh, to anybody that's uh, in hospitality and development. So if you're building a brand new apartment building, senior living, hotel renovations, uh, multi-room kitchen and bath renovations. Yeah. And, we, and we, we, we source and produce the material. Yeah. And what's that sale like? Is it I'm probably pretty long? Very it's, uh, it's, in, it's, in the, it's in between transactional and what the typical sat, you know, enterprise sales would be. Yeah. Uh, it can be up to a year for general contractor, big, you know, big development projects where new apartments and, you know, you got a fancy five-star restaurant on the first floor and that stuff can take quite a long time. Renovations and hospitality are what I would consider transactional. They have a 90 day turnaround uh, and they can be, you know, their, their designs are spec. So you, if you can sell one holiday Inn express, you can sell all of them. Yeah. Uh, and that's kind of our bread and butter that keeps the cash flow moving while we can hunt for whales on the, uh, on the side. And who do the reps call on? Who's the person they talk to? Uh, it's a little bit of a, a <laughs> mystery, a, a little bit of a mystery. So, it's a, the decision maker can be different for every project. Yeah. So you may need to speak to, you may need to speak to the head architect. You may yeah. need to find that the, the actual owner in hospitality, it's going to be the owner for a general contractor's job. Uh, that could be the project manager. That could be the owner's assistant. <laughs> that could be, that can be a lot of different people. So you know, you have to do your due diligence and make sure you're asking the right questions so you don't spin your wheels with people that are just telling you what you want to hear and yeah. find that decision maker. And we're focusing a lot on developing that skill set uh, as we go. And how much is outbound versus inbound? Do you get inbound? A lot of inbound, Yeah, which is nice. So uh, there are a number of different websites and services where contractors and developers can post their bids that say they blast it out basically to everybody yeah. like us that says, hey, first come first serve uh and we are transitioning which is why why the position was kind of created for me is we are transitioning into more of an outbound skill set this company there earlier yeah th th this company has been around for 15 years and it was not a sales organization until now it was uh we took a lot of orders there was yeah. enough money to hit they did seven million dollars a year falling out of bed right and now we need to go do you know, significantly more than that. And um, outbound calls are going to be a big part of that. And I got to believe that your clients want to commoditize you. Mm -hmm. Am I right? Yep. <laughs> How do you get yep. out of that pigeonhole? Good discovery questions. Trying to make sure that we become an asset and a, and a consultant versus just a necessary evil. Yeah. This is the first time I've ever been in a sales organization where the person that we call is going to buy what we offer. You know, I'm used to calling people that start out with a screw you and a please don't ever call me again. And you right. have to win over them. Yeah. They're not These guys, yeah. Yeah, they, yeah. Or they just have a preconceived connotation you know, about, you are. Yeah. and you know, they just, you know, you've been in sales. They hate, <laughs> your job is to make them not hate you. Right. <laughs> like, <laughs> You know, like, that's my strategy. <laughs> yeah. And if, and, and most people, as they go through the sales process, I always say there's this defining moment where it clicks for them, where you stop being a pain in the butt yeah. and you start becoming added value. Helpful. And the yeah. only way that I've ever known how to do that is through open-ended questions, listening intently, writing a million notes, you know, don't ask a question so that you can have a reason to talk. 
ask a question so you can shut up for a minute and let them teach you how to ace the test. It's the yes. bold words in a textbook in high school. I didn't study. I never read a full chapter in my life, but if I, if I, <laughs> if I knew you were a sales rep, it wasn't yeah, a scholar. Right? <laughs> yeah. Right. Like I still got A's. I got great grades, but I just, I read the bullet points, the bold words yep. the day before the test got my, <laughs> got my 90% went on down the road. Uh, but if you just listen, they will teach you how to sell them. They will show you their pain points. Right. And then you recite what they told you back to them and put them in a position to where they either have to say, no, Brian, everything I just said to you was a lie. Yeah. I, or Brian, I, I like what you're saying and everything's correct, but I'm just not comfortable with you or your company yet. Or, okay, so show me where to sign. I mean, I, I, try to, I try to put them in a position where if I recite your words back to you, you, I'm putting you in one of those pigeonholed spots. Right. And most people for as long as I've been in sales, have, it's worked really, really well. And I build relationships that way. And it's led to a lot of success. And because I'm sure they want to both commoditize you and all bring it down to price versus mm -hmm. quality, whatever the attributes of your product and your company are yeah. service, uh, responsiveness, uh, durability, whatever it is. I don't know. Mm -hmm. Yep. They, uh, so it, it's a little, in our business, a lot of people hear about on the news, the Chinese trade war with Trump, right? So what that really means is our business specifically, there was a called an anti-dumping tariff. China was producing quartz and marble. They were manufacturing it below cost cost and sell and you know dumping it in the u.s market well now there's a 400 percent tariff on anything that's quartz related that comes out of china so it disrupted the industry to a point where now you can't it's not a race to the bottom anymore yeah it's not just a race to the price point and you know we'll shake you know you'll sign a contract and it'll there's turmoil uh, the, the vendors and the suppliers in Mexico are getting bombarded with things. Uh, a lot of the shops in China went from, you know, they have a booming economy and everything works like a machine. Well, now they had to take that production and move it to Taiwan, Vietnam, Malaysia. They're not ready for it. Well, for guys like you and me, that adds value to us. Yeah. So a lot of customers don't really know how good you are until something goes wrong. Exactly. How you handle yourself when it's not easy. Yeah. really set yourself apart. Yeah. So staying in constant communication, letting, you know, this coronavirus thing, right? Like, I never, you know, I wasn't even thinking about it a month ago and now I'm like, Oh my God, please don't shut get down away from it. <laughs> yeah. Please don't shut down the ports. You know, and, I, and Trump's tweets were entertainment to me a month ago. And now I'm going, please don't do anything else as far as a tariff goes. Like, yeah. This could screw up everything. So how we, so their ability to commoditize us is diminishing and they're starting to feel that pain as the developers. They're starting to understand that just because you stomp around and own a bunch of hotels and act like a big shot, that has nothing to do with the time it takes to get something from Southeast Asia through customs over to the Pacific. You know, Jeff Bezos can't get something here faster than that. Like yeah. you, you got to deal with what's happening. The market has changed. Yeah. So that's really giving us an opportunity to be salesmen and manage our portfolio and, and take care of our customers when they need us the most. And it's really, really been beneficial for us. It's really and, been beneficial. You know, when you're looking at reps, I'm sure you're doubling your team. What do you look for? So I've boiled, I've boiled a lot of, I've done a lot of hiring and I've always boiled it down to one question that I, that when I'm not certain, I'm obviously looking for extroverts, people with people motivated by money. If you can make me laugh, you, <laughs> if you can, if you're funny, yeah. that means you can think on your feet in real time. Like that's a, that's a real skill. If, you can if you're, yeah, you can connect. If you, if you can, uh, if you can spout off a few analogies and do a third party story and relate other feelings to a points in time to make me understand what you're saying, Third party stories and analogies are the single greatest sales tools in the history of the world. Yeah. Because an analogy puts your, makes you think of a feeling. Right. Something connects, you already know. Yep. You can, you know, however it works, you, you feel that connection and instantly know what I'm talking about. Yeah. 
So I'm looking for all of those qualities, but when I'm out on the, on the fence, I always just ask them one very, it's a weird question, but I just say, what is a greater emotion for you personally? Your love of winning or your hatred of losing? And, they're, and then I say, why? Yeah. And I want them to explain. And, and the right answer is, is I want people who hate to lose. Yeah. I don't want people, I boil it down to if, if you're comfortable losing, you must be used to it. <laughs> And if, if winning, if winning gets you out of bed in the morning, you must not do it very often. Yeah. Um, watch any coach Krzyzewski interview. And he says, I need guys that hate to lose because a guy that hates to lose will show up in the gym without you asking. Yeah. A guy who hates to lose won't say things like we'll get them next month. There's nothing that makes me angrier than we'll get them next month. Yeah. Right. It's just, right? Yeah. It's, it's, it's just, a, a, it's, it's just placating like, to something. Yeah. And, and we get paid the most because we are the rev- we're the engine. We keep the doors on. So yeah. if you want to play in this arena and make the money and get praise and we get the awards and the trips and, you know, we get, you know, we're a bunch of prima donnas. I understand that, but you got to produce. Right. And a guy who, a guy or a girl who hates that feeling, as long as they're, they don't do something unethical to prevent it, you know, I don't want you to hate it so bad you cheat and you don't cheat out of business. Right. Yeah. But I, you know, but if that means that you go home and watch mm-hmm. some YouTube videos or sign up for your class or put some time in or just pester me until you're a professional, that's the guy I want. And I'm more than willing to be there for that person. I, I show up or I'm, I'm a gym rat. I was a college basketball player. I show up first. I leave last. I, I'm six foot seven. I have no interest in power. I think power is for short guys. Uh, I just want it to be right. And I want it to be, I just, I need the results Yeah, because the health of the business requires it. Not because I need accolades or, you know, for it to be my idea. And have you ever hired somebody who answered the question wrong? No, no. <laughs> I've had people, I've had people say they love to win, but I always ask the reason why, because they usually, their explanation is usually because I just can't stand losing. <laughs> yeah. So it's, it's one and the same, but yeah, no, I, I, I did in the beginning and then I started to see a pattern. I'm like, guys who love to win just can't take the rejection. They, they quit. Right. They, it, it, there has to be that emotional attachment to the deal. Mm-hmm. You know, some people say, Oh, you got to distance yourself from the deal in some sense. Yeah. But when you lose, you got to be upset. Mm-hmm. And, yeah. it, and you got to learn something from it. Yeah. I don't need you flipping desks. Right. <laughs> uh, but, but, but I, but you know, and, and, and just to caveat, a lot of things I say are just, you know, just for fun. But like I've told people all the time, I go, I'd rather have you rifle your computer mouse against the wall once in a while than never act like it affects you. Yeah. I'd rather have an emotion towards you being mad you lost than just, well, shucks. Well, you know, Next time will be better. It never tends to get better. Yeah. But it's difficult. You know, you, do you like the athletic background? Because sales it. is a lot like athletics. It's, just, it's a scoreboard for fat old guys, man. It's the best. <laughs> you know, well, it's, it's also it. a performance where, yep. where you get away from, I know how to sell. Well, you yep. know how to, I know how to dribble. Mm-hmm. But I bet you're a better ball player than I am. Uh, right? It's a performance. Yep. It is a performance. That video you did the other day was great. It made a lot of, it, again, I try not, to, I agree with so much of what you say that it's hard. You know, we could talk about that for hours, but you're absolutely right. Right. And, and part of that activity thing, it's distant. This is what you pay me for. Like, this is why I'm here. If, if, if I didn't have these moments, then I wouldn't be the right guy. So I am extremely happy, but I am more excited for you, for you, my team. Yeah. I love watching that glimpse, you know, I'm sure you've seen it a thousand times. You have a sales rep that just kind of doesn't get it, but they they want it, and their eyes almost go like it's like a movie, right? Like it's a close up in the movie when like it the light bulb goes off, and you're like, oh man, he gets it now. He or she yeah. gets it, and then all yeah. of a sudden they start sounding more confident, and they understand why I'm telling them to ask the questions, and they're starting to ask questions deliberately to get responses and lead the person down the path. And that is so cool to me. I know I can sell it. I don't, whatever. But watching somebody else have that, that moment of clarity is, is awesome. 
And when did you have that becoming a rep? Or did you have many of them? I had many of them. So uh, I I got obsessed with, it's a, I guess it's a, it's called Lucian, but it's basically Sandler. It's a spinoff of Sandler training. Yeah. It's a little bit more consultative. And when I got to Angie's list there, he's still my mentor today. His name's Aaron Prickle. He's runs the, he's the VP of the Lucian office here in Indianapolis. And he was the, you know, he was the only guy that I ever met that I couldn't beat in an argument. He was the only guy that, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm cocky. I have no doubt, you know, people, I try not to say I'm arrogant, but you and I talk baseball. I defer to you. I don't know anything about it. Basketball, human psychology and sales. I'm, pretty combative because I take bad. a lot of pride in being good at it. Right. If yeah. You know more about the NHL than me or finance. I'm sure you do. I don't even, I'm out, but I take a lot of pride in my ability to captivate an audience and, and, you know, drive emotions. And I couldn't beat him. He always, he always put me in that corner that I mentioned at the beginning where he, he made me say I was either wrong or he was right. And it was fascinating to me. So at Angie's List, you go through the first round of class that they actually pay for per headcount. And I just, I just ch chased him around like a puppy dog and just begged him to let me go back through. I'm like, I don't think the company's going to pay for me anymore, but I, please let me keep going. Yeah. And I just went through the class as many times as I could and just try. I really, really wanted to be good at it. I desperately wanted to be good at it. I come from a single mother. You know, we didn't make a lot of money. And uh, Grand Rapids at the time, it's much, much different now. But Grand Rapids at the time, my friends were, they were super excited to get extra overtime and you wanted to work construction. And they were just like, man, if I just, man, if I get lucky enough to get another 12 hours of overtime, I'll make 70 grand this year. And I used to just look at it and be like, that is, please, God, don't let that be me. That's, that's it, because I had the same epiphany. I was an engineer working my butt off, built the product flat salary mm -hmm. right i'd see the sales reps driving porsches variable calm yeah. Yeah. one quit i went into the vp's office i go i want to be a sales rep he goes i got an opening <laughs> yeah yeah man right like that's all you got to you know at the age of what like 25 the first time you make a 10k commission you're like holy smokes and back then that was real money this, so this is the only expensive piece of jewelry I've ever bought. It's just a tag Carrera from like 2012. The first check I ever got, they paid me $14,000. I walked up to my boss and went, how many installments? And they're like, like on the 15th. Yeah. I'm like, for what? I'm like, who that does, who that does everybody know you're paying me this much? Like there's no <laughs> way. Well, I went, I literally bought a $7,000 bought a $7, watch out of fear that they were going to just want to come get it yank back. It back. <laughs> yeah. And, and that's the only expensive thing I ever bought. Still to this day, I wear it every day kind of as a reminder. Well, I love it, but like, dude, don't, you can't ever go back. Like you can't you know, go that, back. That's another reason why I'm never really happy about success. Cause I, I've seen it be taken. I've seen man, I've seen peers, you know, get caught up in some, he said, she said, and you're the wrong demographic. So they just fire you because it's not worth the trouble. And it's just, dude, yeah. hold on to this for dear life. And, and that's it because it. it has the income potential of entrepreneurship without mm -hmm. the risk. Yeah. Right. Because yeah, I'm an entrepreneur now and believe me, it's pretty hard uh, ramen noodles for the first year. Mm -hmm. Yeah. There's, there's no net cash flow and putting it back in the business. And right? I'm, seeing, I'm right there. And now I'm the, the owner of our company is in the, the other room over here. And we were going over budget the other day and I'm thinking, this is hard. <laughs> it's work. It's, it's real hard. work. It's real work. Yeah. Yeah. Stressful. And what else do you look for when you interview people? Do you look for sports backgrounds, performance histories? I have, I really just, I want, first and foremost, I want to, I want them to be likable. Yeah. I want them to be the type of person that I want to work with every day. I will take a hard worker with a great attitude that applies the coaching that I give them over a seasoned guy with a bunch of bad habits who thinks that he's going to, 
he's going to show me, you know, whatever. So really it's, it comes right down to just, like I said, likability. Can, can you make me laugh? How do you tell stories? How do you react to my questions? Cause I'm very tough in interviews. I try to talk everybody out of a job yeah. and then I want to see if they'll push back. Like I'm trying to give them some, some, some pain, like they're going to experience on the phone or yeah. like this, you know, like our world, you know, it, that's what our world is. Our world is just understanding that a lot of it's pain. <laughs> and if it you is. Not, yeah. 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 And have you ever made a hiring mistake? Yes. Of course I have. Everybody yeah. has. And again, yeah. you try to get better and you try to look for those cues and sometimes they're, sometimes they're excellent salesmen in the interview and right. it's not necessarily what you, you're not getting what they presented, but Hey, you know, we, we correct that as we move forward and they reveal themselves pretty quickly. You know, yeah. if, if, if you lied to me and I fell for it, then my bad, but we'll straighten it out. And do you care about college education? Nope. <laughs> Smart man. Sure don't. No. I can't, no. That's, a, that's another beautiful part about our job is I don't care if you got the chops, man. I don't care your race, color, creed, gender. I don't care if you're a team player and you want to hang out with, with us and, and build something and you got the chops, come on down. Yeah. Absolutely. And wh- what have you seen not work? with reps you know so everybody's built a little bit different so i try to i try to manage to the individual and motivate them as their own Person. you know yeah. i can't manage everybody the same it won't work so the, what won't work is when they are more afraid of how they sound or being pushy or, you know, uh, I've been saying forever, there aren't little kids across America playing telemarketer in their front yard. Uh, <laughs> you know what I mean? So like, <laughs> no basketball today. Let's do some cold calling. Yeah, hey, hey, let's overcome objections, Johnny. Like, you want to say, how about a subject line, Johnny? <laughs> yeah. 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 Exactly. How do we, how do we write the, you know, how do we gain attention and, 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 and push what's the right email? subject line right like that doesn't happen you're trying to be a fireman or a undercover cop or something right. fun and also people especially at least when i was a kid and i think maybe it's the same is when the neighbor got a brand new car and i looked at my mom and said I wonder how much that cost she told me to mind my own business she said we don't you know you don't talk about you know talk about religion you don't talk about money yeah well now I'll, now for a living every, I, you know i'm a crazy person i just ask everybody what do you make like, am I winning? They look at me, they look back at me like I am crazy because that's still not normal to them. So there's a lot of weird things in our business. You have to be willing to push and have a drive to get through. But if you're all people, people will always avoid the thing they're afraid of the most. So if you are the mo- if you are more afraid to s- sound like a salesman, quote unquote, then you are afraid to tell your kids we can't go to disneyland this year because daddy couldn't make enough sales then you're going to lose but that i can't get in your head and make that happen and some people need to be in a performance cycle or you know a warning cycle some people need the gun to their head because i'm way more afraid of losing my job and my benefits than i am sounding pushy on the phone but then I go hit my number and I reset the sales cycle. And then now I'm, you know, now I got some time, so we'll get them next week. Yeah. And it all derives back to, they just don't hate losing enough. Yeah. And what skill do you wish you had earlier in your career that you either have now or you're developing now? I just, I just wish I'd have just shut up and listened even more. Just this, you know, the way I teach now is exactly the way I want them to sell. I ask them a million questions right. and get them to see that it's best for them. Like I'm not just the boss saying do it cause I said so, but we talk it through and it's like, do you see why you should give more information to the estimators and help them understand yeah. the job so that they're not bogged down with work and making you late on your proposal yeah. delivery time? Like, do you see, what are some things that are going wrong in your day to day that are making you frustrated or 
and they'll yeah. tell you, and then you just lead them down the path to help them. That's it. Solve, solve their own problems. Most reps just feel obligated to be talking mm -hmm. instead of obligated to be asking. Mm -hmm on and on and on and it's probably like the number one thing if they mm -hmm. can't slow down ask a great question and hear the other person out mm -hmm. you know and i think i had the advantage of just being such an introvert or shy that talking was more painful than asking mm -hmm. so i just came up with good questions and <laughs> work work for you man. It worked. that's awesome <laughs> yeah I mean, and now you're now I wouldn't consider you an extrovert or an introvert. Not at all. Right? Like those, not, no. those those videos, like when people watch your videos, they're not realizing that you are literally walking. I'm assuming your neighborhood <laughs> with like a selfie stick. Yeah. <laughs> right. Well, like film crew, film crew, film crew. <laughs> right. Like yeah. think of most people wouldn't be willing to do that because they would worry about what people think when they look yeah. at them. But in who get, who cares, right? Like I, I don't no. care, right? I know, but that's the beauty that's of it. it. And Man. people have come up to me and said, "What are you doing? Yeah, what is that? It's yeah. an iPhone, mm -hmm. right? Have you heard of it? <laughs> yeah, like why? Like why? Why would you be doing yeah. this every day? Like <laughs> I mean, yeah, it's just are you willing to? You want to win more than you, you want to win, or you want to be able to say that whatever you whatever you're most afraid of is more important than your neighbors looking at you funny. Yeah, I don't care. And, right, and, that's, yeah. and, and that's just not the same from the vast majority of, of the yeah. population. Cool. Hey, this has been a great conversation. Where can people go to follow you and connect with you? Oh, geez. You, LinkedIn. I'm on yep. LinkedIn the most. Uh, I think I'm the only Kyle Sherwood spelled this way in America. So yep. if, you, uh, if you type in Kyle Sherwood, I, usually, I, I try to put out some tips of the day and just general things to help add value to someone's day. I'm not bloviating and all that stuff, but try to help, try to make it valuable and try to make it applicable. And are your openings in Indianapolis or does it matter? Indianapolis right now? Yes. Yep. Cool. So we, need, we have 12 employees now. We need 50 by this time next year. If you can do a, if you can do an estimate for kitchen and bath, if you know what a takeoff is, if you just know what that means, I want to hear from you. Well, you might get some strippers or something. That's fine. <laughs> That's fine too. That's fine too. You know, there's a need, there's a, there's a time and a place. <laughs> now, since asking uh, or having this interview, I put a post up on LinkedIn uh, oh. to get other people's perspective on this. <laughs> it got about, uh, at the time of this recording, about 85,000 views, uh, probably about 600 comments on it. Uh, I don't know if how much time people put into thinking it through. I think a lot of people just want to be positive, and I get Kyle's perspective. And then I, I did some research on the psychology behind it. So it's people who are either avoiding a pain or gaining a pleasure, uh, but clearly the research shows that people will do more to avoid a pain than they will to get pleasure. Now, each person's different. I get that. You probably want to ask yourself what motivates you. What keeps you up at night? And the key distinction of this is motivating you, getting out of our comfort zone. And you know, for a long time, I've been thinking about you know, our whole educational system today is why do we get on a bus and go to a building? Why can't we just do it on TV at home? It, it's to get us out of our comfort zone, to stay in one place. I, I'm sure that wasn't the original intention. The original intention was there was no TV, and the teacher was in one place, and everybody had a meet up in one place, and there's a little socialization to it. But it's a little bit of structure, a little bit of discipline. It's like a lot of times, why do people have personal trainers? Uh, we all can count to 12, but the personal trainer keeps motivation, rhythm, guidance to it, but sometimes we don't have that within ourselves. Now, think about the last time you lost a deal. How did you process it? Did it motivate you to work harder the next time? Do you remember those things? Or you do, do you gloss over them? Now, I think the key thing that I look for in salespeople, I look for competitiveness because there has to be an emotional attachment to winning or avoiding losing. If there isn't, people don't care. Now, this I saw a lot in the 
the engineers that never went into sales. They'd shrug their shoulders if they lost. They'd blame it on the product. And it always frustrated me because I, I, I'd get a little uh, involved in it. And I took it uh, personally. And as mammals, uh, the loss of a deal or rejection in any kind is kind of being thrown out of the tribe to be ostracized, which is the closest thing to death in the mammal brain because our ability to survive on our own is diminished compared to surviving with the tribe. So as an interview question, um, I, I think... Some people have thought through it. Clearly, Kyle's thought through it. And I like his argument. And I can't disagree with his argument. I, I, I do agree with it. But I think it takes contemplation to answer it correctly, to answer it honestly and sincerely, other than uh, arrogantly or saying, oh, I never lose because I always learn something. Yeah, good, good. Yeah, that's a good attitude. Uh, we should learn from our losses. We paid the price. Did we get the education? Did we learn the lesson? And I, I got to tell you, uh, most salespeople and people in general are reactive. They don't take action until there's a problem. But sales is just the opposite. It's counterintuitive. It's a prevention profession. So many things are easily prevented versus repaired. If you lose a deal... How hard is that to win back? <laughs> a lot harder than it is to plan to win it. And trust me, that's how I learned. And I lost a huge deal in my career. I was overconfident. Uh, my champion was lying or misleading to me, <laughs> telling me we were ahead. And we were. We, I mean, the technology was there. Uh, we had uh, an ingrained uh, projects that were very high profile, uh, but we were competing against a huge company. We were tiny, you know, less than 100 people competing against, you know, 500 person company with 100 times more revenue. Now, was our product a better match? It was. And I was overconfident about it, thinking that. But the, the other rep did a better job at talk calling around me. And that early in my career, I learned that lesson. I paid that price. That was a, a college education uh, in, in cost and lost commission for me. So I, I, I said, well, I, I now paid the price. Uh, it still hurts to this day when I dig it up and look at it. And that, that's really where I came up with the prevention thing because it could have been prevented. I think it could have. And if you look at that and you look at your deals, you'll start to see that pattern. And this is kind of what I teach in the course as far as preventing. What should a deal look like to win versus lose? And, and the things are very consistent over and over again. And they're intuitive traps that we fall into as human. We're confident. We believe it's about the product. We believe what the client says is 100% accurate. It's just what they're saying at that moment. People change their mind all the time. And what you learn in the course is how to put that onto paper, onto your computer, so you can see the whole picture. People aren't playing the whole game of sales. They're doing some prospecting. They're pitching. They're presenting. They're demoing. They're handling objections, but that that those are the functions. That's not the whole game. You're not thinking like a client. You're thinking like a salesperson, and you're missing the point because you're blinded by your own goal. And that's how I show you how to start thinking like a client, how to come up with a system. And, and it's not a two-day workshop. It's a year-long course with two, at least two hours of fresh content put in per week. So it's growing. So the course is different this week than it was last week. You got so many examples, ideas, and perspectives on it that people who are in the course have different products, markets, and you get to hear how they're doing it. And of course, the problems that come up are all in the repair phase. What I try and get everybody is into the prevention because 
If you don't treat it like a prevention profession, you're only going to win the easy deals. You're not going to win the hard deals. And if you look at your comp plan, they're all back end loaded, meaning all the income is when you get closer above your quota, which means you've got to get the marginal deals. You've got to get more and bigger deals faster and how to focus your time because the intuitiveness in sales and from Mount High is to be busy. But busy doesn't generate revenue. Selling generates revenue. Closing deals. The commission on a lost deal is zero. The commission on a pipeline deal until it closes is zero. So our job is to get those precious few over the clo- over the line. So everyone asks, you know, tell me about the course. Here, here's the, the spiel. Now you can go and we can have a conversation for 15 minutes by going to b2brevenue.com, hit the training tab and schedule a call. Um, this is the content, 100% access day one. You can pay for it all at once or in 12 equal monthly payments. It's not a membership, but it's insanely affordable uh, compared to when I did it on site. It's about a third the price of doing it on site. It does require that you have a little bit of getting out of the comfort zone, meaning that you have to listen to the video, watch and listen to the videos, uh, the office hours, uh, schedule a one-on-one, or listen to the other ones that apply to a particular part of the sales process that you're facing. So you get all the content, 100% access, day one, go as fast or as slow as you want, up to you. You got a year-long access to it. I'd say you know at least an hour a week, uh, dedicate to it, uh, maybe another hour of applying it, thinking it through, taking your game to the next level. I mean, all you have to do is close half a deal for it to pay for itself. And if you are too lazy to become better at sales, do not contact me, okay? Don't waste my time or yours, but especially mine. <laughs> because nobody hates wasting time more than me because I don't want to... Exactly, that... I don't feel like doing. The other part is you get unlimited 30-minute one-on-ones with me. No flunky, uh, no number two, uh, no mini-me, where we can apply the course to your deals. Now, why would I do that? I record them anonymously without your name, your company, your product, because it doesn't matter. What matters is give me the situation. What would you like to accomplish? What do you think is going to happen? What's your strategy? And we talk it through. Now, isn't that what every sales rep wants? I want that. You know, I I talk to my friends about it, but they don't care and they don't know sales. So it's really not very helpful, you know, and I just feel like exactly terrible. I feel like that. What I want is to talk to another rep, somebody who knows like, well, what's your fear? Where are you? Uh, Where do you want to go? What do you think is going to happen? And how are you going to get? That's right. How are you going to get that beautiful cashish? So, and you get to listen to other people's. And you get to see like, oh, okay, they're meeting with a financial person. How do I prepare for that? I try and play the client in the particular situation. I ask myself, if I was that client, what would I be thinking? What would I want? And what would be the next step? Now, when you have done the number of deals that I've done at the number of companies that I've done them at, you start to notice patterns. And that was my job as an engineer. Because software engineering is all about patterns. It's taking what is consistent among the 80%, putting it into a program, an algorithm. Now, sales is like that. Then when you apply neuroscience, psychology, organizational behavior, uh, political motives, the mammal brain, do you think I'm passionate about this? I live and breathe this every day. You know, I, I listen to you know every book I can get access to. I apply it to my deals. I help the students with their deals. What I, my objective is to get you to win. If the money is more important than you being successful, don't call me. I get it. It's okay. I got tons of free stuff out there, and everyone, uh, you know, being a B player is the default. It is. To get to an A player, you got to get out of that comfort zone. And to get 
more out of life, to close more deals. Our whole job is to get ourselves out of the comfort zone. The comfort zone is uh, becoming a B player, doing 80% of your quota, getting by. And right now with the economy doing so well, a lot of us can do it. I want you to get excited. Get to the place you want to go. Expand that comfort zone just a little bit every day. Learn a bit. Apply a bit. See how other people are doing. Polish it. Because what you heard today in the interview is the performance of it. Uh, you You hear sports analogies. We think everything is just a transaction. And it is until it isn't. How many transactions have you done where the person didn't get what they wanted? You didn't get what you wanted. How many Amazon boxes have you opened up and you go, uh, I, this is not what I thought. Amazon didn't cheat you. It's exactly what they put on the page. They didn't mislead you. You misunderstood it like I did. <laughs> I'd say probably you know, quite a few things. I had a little home repair thing. I think I had to buy three different things before I got the right one. This is what our clients are going through every day. And our job is to get them to make sure they get the right thing that they want to solve the problem. And our job is to get the deal done. So what else can you do for me? Tell a friend about the podcast. Go on to LinkedIn. If you like my comical videos, give me a little thumbs up, a little comment, a little share. I appreciate that. If you're a YouTuber, go over to Maverick Method on YouTube. I put a video uh, representation of the interview up there if you like to watch it in video uh, versus just audio alone. Also, you get to see the expression. So there's a little bit more um, uh, content there. Also, you get to see the power of video. And I mean, the power of audio is you, you can listen to this while you're driving, working out, walking around. But sometimes you want to see the people, see the expressions, the gestures, and the difference that video can make. So make sure you're going to covideo.com to get the video email, pipe drive, brutal truth coupon code, and make sure you listen to the other two podcasts, sales questions, brutally honest answers, the B2B revenue leadership show. We'll see you next time. Hey, if you want to be on the show, share your story or your particular sales skill. Love to have you. Uh, just send me an uh, in mail over on LinkedIn. We'll see you soon.